Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a great Monday. Mine's pretty good so far, but I have to go do a ton of yard work. And I was doing a ton of yard work yesterday until I saw a snake. And then that was the cutoff. So in my mind, if I just say the little snake moved on and will never come back, I can go out today. Although we know he's probably or she is probably still out there. Oh, I hate snakes, y'all. I'm serious. If my neighbors have ring cams, I would love to go look and see what they found yesterday when that snake crossed my path. It was not pretty. I probably looked like I had a big meltdown. I am wearing my Justice for Gavin shirt. I love wearing these shirts and the bracelets. I got a Justice for Gavin bracelet. He's right there beside Tylee J.J. Charles. Have one coming for Tammy. This is my Justice arm. I do not wear these bracelets after Justice has been served. Until then, they stay here 24-7. And I love being able to tell people when they ask, what does your shirt mean? What does this bracelet mean? To give them a little glimpse of the victims and their story. And hopefully they go home and do their research and follow up and support justice for these victims. All right, so Chad Daybell, his trial has been scheduled for April 1st of next year. It's going to go through the end of May. I'm looking forward to the phone pings. That's kind of my big thing with Chad's case. Where was Chad during very crucial times, such as the night and the time frames, text messages, things like that? There's a lot that's going to be repetitive. It's a lot of the same evidence, which is why initially these cases were joined. But I think with Chad, we will hear some different things that will be new and will give even more insight into what we learned at Lori's trial, which was bad enough. I also watched Shiny Happy People over the weekend. It's the Duggar Family Secret documentary. It's, I believe, four parts. I'm going to tell you, it was not shiny or happy. It was sick and disturbing. We have listeners who do not have access to this documentary because they live in a country where it's not being streamed. And I've had a ton of requests for people who want me to do an episode on summarizing what we learned in this documentary. So I'm going to try to do that at some point this week. I'm still ticking through the Letitia Stout trial. It's a lot to be six weeks behind on covering a trial. So I'm grouping in days, but I'll try to sneak a little episode in about shiny, happy people this week and let you guys know what happened on it. Some people just don't want to watch it because it's so dis- it, it is so disturbing, y'all so disturbing when they're talking about blanket training where you take infants who are crawling and then you spank them every time they go off the blanket it just made my skin crawl babies are curious and you are beating the curiosity out of these kids so i will do that for you guys all right music fact of the day somewhere over the rainbow was listed by the american film institute as the greatest film song ever The song was actually written about America rising up from the Great Depression under FDR's New Deal. There you go. It's not just about a girl from Kansas that wanted to get away. We're going to jump back into part three, the last part of days one through three in the Letitia Stout trial. At this point, Al, who is Gannon's father, is on cross-exam. And Al said that he and Landon were separated when he and Letitia got together. Now, South Carolina here, he mentions, we have a one-year wait for a no-fault divorce, which is ridiculous. I mean, you're forcing two people that clearly don't want to be married to stay together legally for a year in order to get that divorce. The reasoning I've heard is if there is a chance of reconciliation, they give it a year. Come on, people. If people want to get divorced, making them drag it out a year ain't going to help. Pet peeve of mine, but hey. Al, Landon, and Letitia played softball together, and he first met her in 2013 during that fall softball league. She was a good player and even coached at one point, I believe at the high school level. During the spring and summer of 2014, it progressed to a romantic relationship, and he owned the marital house that he and Landon lived in, and it sold in August, and they had an every-other-week custody agreement, so he would come stay at the house when it was his week, Landed would stay there with the kids when it was her week, and it just gave the kids that stability, which I think is really smart and and a good thing when parents can get on that same page to do what's best for the kids. He and Letitia married in January of 2015, and he filed for custody of Gannon and Lena. He was worried there could have been some drug use in the house, and the mugshot, if you remember, we we 
were mentioning when she had sent this picture of Quincy Brown. And he said, oh, great, you found a mugshot. It's also on the same page where I found so-and-so's mugshot. Apparently, this was someone who was living with Landon, and he had found this guy's mugshot. When Al went to Alaska, Letitia and the kids stayed in Myrtle Beach, and she was the primary caregiver for that fall semester. The defense asked if he told a detective he put the kids in counseling after the divorce, and Al said it was after they had moved to Colorado. So the initial plan was that Letitia would come to Alaska with the kids, and she came to visit a couple of times, but as we know, she did not like Alaska. Her attorney said she lived in South Carolina, liked the beach, the sun, and just the atmosphere of Myrtle Beach. And Alaska was barren and depressing at night. And Al says, if you're asking me to testify about how she felt, I can't. When he was in Alaska, he got custody in March of 2018, and the kids went with him immediately after that to Alaska, and they finished school there. In the fall, the custody arrangement started with Letitia. The attorney says, you felt safe with that? And Al said, yes, he did. Al says from what he observed, it appeared she had a good relationship with Gannon and he had love and trust for Letitia. They show a picture from Mother's Day of a Mother's Day card that Gannon had written and the defense asked Al if that was from Gannon. Al said he would need some handwriting samples to compare it to he said he hasn't seen his son's handwriting in three years. They move on. Al's mom, as we know, is a nurse practitioner in the mental health field, and Al had talked to her about Letitia. The defense asked if she thought Letitia needed to be medicated, and he says he doesn't remember. Then he asks about Letitia being a Kobe Bryant fan, and he said she was a super fan of Derek Jeter and the Yankees from what he can remember and not so much a Kobe Bryant fan. They talk about the Garden of the Gods hike, which is when I believe Gannon had an accident and Letitia got frustrated. And the defense asked if she posted a picture onto her Instagram from that hike. And Al doesn't remember. Al seemingly doesn't do social media. He's made that pretty clear, which may not be a bad thing. It would be hard to not do it. But man, sometimes I wish I could just walk away sometimes and never come back. It can be so negative. They move on to when the candle was knocked over. He said he got messages from Gannon about it, but never spoke to Gannon directly. The information about that incident came from Letitia. Gannon was worried he was going to be grounded for a year after that happened. He said Letitia picking him up from the airport in the rental car was weird, but he thought they were on the same page as far as trying to find out where Gannon was. He never thought Landon or her husband at that time was involved. The defense reads a statement Al gave saying that Landon's husband did come to mind, but he later says that it was just, he was just going through possibilities in his mind of who might want to hurt Gannon. He really didn't give the husband much thought from what he said on the stand. As the days go on, things Letitia were saying obviously weren't adding up. And it started with the rental car. That kind of seemed odd to him. But like he said, he thought they were still on the same page. But then not seeing her car at that elementary school was really the biggest red flag that he had initially that she's not being truthful with him. Letitia was supposed to go to the police station and they needed to bring something to get Gannon's DNA. So Al volunteered to take that stuff by himself. Letitia left with Harley on January 29th and did not come back until she came to get her stuff and she came with family members of hers that were helping her get her belongings. They move on to the recorded calls and ask Al how long between the calls it was the first recorded call was on February 13th. And before that, there were emails, text messages, and phone calls between him and Letitia. But he said by the time he's recording the calls, he said at minimum she was a person of interest, but he had high suspicion that she did something to Gannon. He also said that the first sex assault story was the first change that she had in her story besides Gannon just went to a friend's house and didn't come home. Letitia goes to the sheriff's office to be interviewed about the assault story that same morning that she told Al about it. Once she had that change in story, he got very suspicious. He said once he didn't see the car at the school, it just started kind of piling on. The defense asked Al if it was the Wednesday she went to the sheriff's office and didn't come back. And Al said that Detective Riley was at the house and the intention was for Letitia to follow that detective back to the sheriff's station he doesn't know where she went after that point. He never saw her come home after that. And that would have been January 29th. 
The defense asked how the FBI knew Letitia would be calling him the day they first started recording the calls. Al said he just tried to keep her on the hook with messages, and the calls were planned to some degree so he could be there with the FBI and the sheriff's office agents who were not only recording the calls, but also coaching him throughout the process of what to ask her. February 13th and the 14th were when the most calls were recorded. That's really what we've been doing the last two episodes before this one. He's asked how long of a gap there was, and Al said it was grueling to keep his cool, knowing that she had all the information about Gannon, and he just doesn't remember how much time elapsed between the phone calls. The defense points out that when we get into Valentine's Day on the 14th of February, that Al started to lose his cool. Al said, I'm frustrated, period, but I did a good job keeping my cool. Yes, sir, you did. He said, on one call, he was aggressive, and on another, he was calmer. I really was impressed with this shift in him. There was one specific call where she talks about the accident with the Craigslist fake guy. And he says, what happened, baby? It's like he really switched from being a little bit frustrated to kind of reeling her in. And I was so impressed with his composure on that call right there. All of them, of course. But that switch where he's trying to get her to admit to something. Something happened. Maybe you panicked. Maybe it was an accident. You didn't know what to do. And when he says, tell me what happened, baby, I was like, dang, he's good at this. Defense says she's changing stories with no consistency. And they don't make sense. It goes from Eduardo to Quincy Brown. Would you agree they were garbage stories, as you said? And Al says, of course, yes. The defense says Letitia is trying hard to convince Al that someone had kidnapped Gannon and it appeared to be her goal. Al said, I can't speak to her goal or her intent. And the defense says she's not saying, hey, I'm crazy on February 13th and those recorded calls. Al says she doesn't say it on any of the phone calls that she's crazy. The defense says she makes statements on the 13th saying at one point when she's talking to Al, I have parts of the information, but I don't have part of the information. Not after night, I've dreamed of different things and have added details to this. And at some point, Letitia said she blacked out. The defense says at one point, she said, I sit back and remember it, lay it, play it again in my head and play it again in my head. And then I woke up out of this state of confusion. I was going crazy. Al says to the defense, okay, this is all just a word salad. It doesn't make sense. This is coming from Letitia. So, of course, it's not going to make sense. But I love the way Al kind of for the next few questions just goes, okay, yeah, okay. He just agrees. He doesn't confirm or deny anything that the defense attorney is saying. He just says, okay. The defense says all of it was a blur. I tried to figure it out and hoped it was a dream. The next to the last phone call, Letitia says, Tisha doesn't know where Gannon is. And Al said he doesn't remember her saying that. The defense says it's on the recording. And Al says, okay. The defense says, you said to Detective Bethel, things with her were down and up and down and up. And you don't ride the roller coaster if you disagree with her. As far as Letitia with the kids, you say on March 6, 2020, in an interview with the FBI, that sometimes she would be great with the kids. And then at times, it would seem like she didn't want to have anything to do with Gannon or Elena. In moments of trust, she would help the kids with homework. She would cook. She would do things like that. And sometimes the kids would be left to fend for themselves. At times, Letitia and Landon, according to the defense attorney, would work together. And seemingly, it was trying to maybe back Al into a corner. And then at other times, they were at each other's throats. Letitia would take trips out of the blue. Al never knew where she got the money to do these trips. The defense asked if he told investigators she, she sometimes likes to refer to herself as Taylor, and Al said yes. In the beginning of the relationship, she told Al that a stepfather had abused her. It wasn't a pattern, but she explained it was more of an isolated event. She eventually moved in with her grandparents in North Carolina. The defense asked if that bonded them since he also had some childhood trauma Al said they discussed it, but he doesn't know if that was a foundation of their relationship was this common bond of childhood trauma. The defense points out she had a hard time staying employed, and Al said she intentionally left eight jobs within a few years. It's interesting. Little things like that add up in the end when we're here, which is you have eight places of employment that probably all eight was somebody else's fault as to why she left. Professional victim. 
In late fall of 2019, the defense says she was having mental health issues, and Al said he wasn't aware of any mental health issues. The defense asked if he knew Letitia was seeing a doctor, and Al said he went with her once to see a doctor. However, he didn't go in the back with her. He stayed in the lobby while she was being seen. The defense asked if she had lorazepam for most of their relationship, and he said at some point he remembers she did get a script for anxiety, and he is asked if he remembers the doctor telling Letitia to quit her job due to mental health issues. Al says, don't remember that. He says he only knows personally of one visit to see a doctor by Letitia. He told an investigator that he didn't think Letitia had mental health issues. Al said if he put Harley on the hot seat, she would defend her mom, but Harley said her mom was, quote, freaking nuts and crazy. This is what the defense attorney is saying to Al as he's on the stand. He really didn't respond. There were no further questions. So on redirect, the state says, you said Letitia was a good softball player. Al says, yes. He asked if softball has rules. Al says, yes. The state says, did she follow those rules? Yes. Did she know how to use strategy? Yes. Al said, I would say her being a coach at the high school level would make her good at using strategy. She taught other people how to play. And does that mean she knew right from wrong? And Al says, yes. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. And I gave it a try because I wanted better gut health, more energy, immune system support, and I hate taking pills and vitamins. I wanted a supplement that was easy. And I've always struggled with what to buy. I ended up taking eight different supplements every morning at one point, and it was just too much. AG1 is super easy. It's one scoop of powder mixed with water once a day. That's it. AG1 has become part of my morning routine. And get this, it's packed with 75 different vitamins and minerals. On top of boosting my gut health and having more energy, my hair, skin, and my nails all look healthier. I also like the immune system support it provides since I'm on crowded planes and airports and courtrooms with a lot of people on a regular basis. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs, which are super handy when you're traveling with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. They move on to the custody exchange when Al said he felt the kids were safer with Letitia than Landon at the time. Then the state asked Al, would you have said the same thing if she had severe mental health issues at the time? Of course, he says no. Did she have severe mental health issues at the time? Al says no. January 28th was a day after the first contact with law enforcement at that Starbucks where Letitia and Al met them there. And you delivered something for DNA and Al said it was a toothbrush and maybe a shoe. Remember, we just said that Al went alone to deliver this stuff for DNA. He interviewed again after delivering that stuff. And then a third time later that evening, the defense said counseling started in Myrtle Beach and there was some conflict about when it started. This is the counseling for Gannon and Lena. The state points out he was distracted by Gannon being missing and he was getting all of his information from Letitia. He initially believed her when she said that he just didn't come home, but that changed over time because of her actions. I don't think I made really clear earlier, but the defense was trying to say that Gannon and Lena had started counseling in Myrtle Beach. Al points out the name of the doctor, and it wasn't possible because this doctor was in Colorado and not Myrtle Beach. So the defense was trying to say it was way earlier that they started counseling, and Al says no, it was after the move to Colorado. He's asked about his mom talking to Letitia and Al said her anxiety was the issue, but she was able to function. So the state starts rattling off things. Could she scramble eggs? Yes. Could she cut vegetables without cutting herself? Yes. Did she ever run out into the street screaming and yelling while naked? No. He said that Letitia would call him from different numbers and would message him from her iCloud during the time Gannon was missing. The state points out with law enforcement having her phone, she found other ways to contact him, showing that she knew what she was doing. That's a good point. Back to the Starbucks interview, he expressed concerns about Landon's ex with his background that he had. And at that time, he was just operating on very limited information and was going through any possibility that would lead him to his son. He said it seemed odd to him that Letitia was resisting going to the sheriff's office. He said, you know, why would you not go? 
And he said, for her, it was a conscious decision not to go. They talk about when the defense asked about the inconsistencies in her stories. And the state asked if she had consistencies with her stories and what was happening with the investigation. And Al said once the search moved to the county line road, then and only then does she place herself in the area trying to explain why her GPS would show she was in that area. They found the board with Gannon's blood and DNA in that area, by the way. He said the relationship overall was like riding a roller coaster and said it's it's not uncommon in marriages that you have your ups and downs and, and good and bad times. The state asked about her manipulating and Al said those were the extreme lows in their relationship and it was really common for her to do that. And I cannot even imagine how much this man was manipulated knowingly and like with him not even knowing he was being manipulated. We see how poorly she tried to manipulate him while Gannon was missing. But I think at that point she was frantic and knew the walls were closing in to where in a normal setting she had more time to kind of plan out the manipulation and he probably was a victim of that so many times without ever realizing probably to this day situations it's crazy how that is just a form of domestic abuse y'all mental abuse is abuse when they had bad times in their relationship it was often a result of her manipulation or lies he would have to sort through he said just like in the phone calls to get the truth the lows were never a product of severe mental illness. When Letitia referred to herself as Taylor, Al said her Facebook said Tisha Taylor, and Letitia said her middle name was Lynn, and she just wanted it to be Taylor. She never used that name, and she never acted crazy, no other personalities or anything like that around Al. Talking about her jobs, at the beginning of their marriage, she was working at an elementary school in Myrtle Beach, and she quit. We know, I think that was where Landon's uncle was the superintendent. Al said it was a good place, and she actually seemed fine there. As far as he knows, she has never been seen for any severe mental illness. Letitia told him many times, also, don't talk to authorities. And then the jury had no questions for Al. So what's cool about Colorado, and I really do think this would be awesome if this was like a nationwide thing where the jury can question witnesses after they're finished with their cross-exam redirect. I think that would help deliberations maybe go a little quicker instead of having to look at notes and go back weeks and weeks to be able to ask that witness directly, I think that's a really, really cool thing. Just pointing that out. That was something I haven't pointed out in the last couple of episodes, by the way. So at this point, we're finished with Al. And the next witness is Macon Ponder. He is a bridge inspector, one of two who found Gannon's body in the suitcase in Florida. The bridge is on a river, and that bridge is several miles from the ocean. The river dumps out to a bay then to a pass, and then into the Gulf of Mexico. They would inspect it every two years on the interstate and the state roads. They go out as a team and had someone, he had someone with him that day named Matthew. March 17th, the bridge requires an underbridge inspection. And as they were near the end of the bridge, they saw the suitcase that had Gannon's remains in it near the end of the bridge, kind of in a marshy area at the wood line. They didn't look at it at that point. They kept inspecting the bridge. So he goes on to explain how they measure the bridge. They came back about an hour to an hour and a half later. That's how long it took to inspect the underside of that bridge. Once they're back in the area where the suitcase was, they did not need a machine that would raise them up. It almost seems like a cherry picker he's talking about because the bridge gets lower and gets closer to land. So they went over to where the suitcase was out of curiosity. He said it was laying at an odd angle, but the handle was towards the underside of the bridge. He went to get the handle and noticed it was really heavy, and he thought maybe it was just waterlogged with clothes or something like that. Because of the location being marshy and muddy, they moved the suitcase under the bridge where it was flat and sandy. This poor man, y'all, he constantly is clearing his throat. He's trying not to get emotional. The, these are other victims of Letitia. These are people that found this poor boy's body that will never be the same. They will always remember this terrible, terrible moment, I'm sure, the rest of their lives. He said before they even unzipped the suitcase, they immediately noticed the odor. 
He looked up at Matt and said, there's something dead in there. And this is so terrible. But he said, sometimes people will throw out like a litter of puppies. But this was different. The smell was very different. And initially, they didn't open it. He said they thought about what to do at first, but ultimately decided to just go ahead and unzip the suitcase. He said the smell was so overpowering that the both of them had to step back. And then he looked and saw two little feet with football socks on. He couldn't really make out what it was. And so Matt dumped the suitcase over and then they saw it was a body, but they could not tell if the body was a male or female. He said he did notice it had a lot of black hair and then they turned away. He said there was lots of bedding in the suitcase and the body was in a fetal position and partially wrapped before they dumped it. Matt, who was with him, is a volunteer fireman and had some experience with dead bodies. They call 911. Macon calls his supervisor and said, obviously, they're having to shut down the inspection. And so authorities arrive and they talk to the both of them who found Gannon's remains. They show the witness photos of Google Earth images of the bridge. And they also show photos of where the suitcase was found. And then a few of the suitcase open with the bedding inside. Cross exam was questioning about the equipment they use and flooding in the area. There were no jury questions. So that was all with Mr. Ponder. The next witness is Jason Yoder. I believe it's called Escambia County Sheriff's Office Investigator. He was a major crime detective with the Santa Rosa Sheriff's Office. He was assigned as the lead detective at the time Gannon's remains were found. He explains as Cambia borders the Florida border of Alabama and the bridge connects those two counties. When he got to the scene, he called the crime scene unit and then when they arrived, they began processing the scene. He saw Gannon's body and it looked like he was rolled out of the suitcase as the last witness described they did. He also saw pillows and blankets in there. He saw an indentation of where the suitcase had been resting before the two bridge inspectors moved it. The suitcase was in the wood line and it was away from the bridge. He's asked about Candlewood Suites in Pensacola and there's a map shown with the hotel noted as well as where the suitcase was found. And after they left the scene, they went to their office and searched for missing kids statewide and region wide. Someone in the office brought the missing poster for Gannon for them to look at. He said the dental features were the same with the gap in the two front teeth specifically being what stood out to him that this could be Gannon who was on the poster. They didn't know for sure the body was a child at that point, but the clothing and the size kind of helped him to assume this was a child's body. The next day was when they did Gannon's autopsy. He took the photo of Gannon to the autopsy with him. And then the medical examiner cleaned Gannon's remains. And he said at that point, it became really likely that this, in fact, was Gannon. They were eventually able to positively ID him. They showed him photos of the scene and the body at the bridge. He was present at autopsy when the pillow and the blankets were photographed. And they show photos of these to the witness and the jury. Gannon had on jogging pants and athletic top and socks with footballs on them. Then they show photos of the flyer. Then you see pictures of Gannon alive on the screen, just previous photos where they're pointing out that gap in his teeth to help him to make that initial preliminary identification that, that this was likely Gannon. They contacted the El Paso Sheriff's Office there in Colorado to let them know they found a body and the blankets. They told them that they thought this was likely Gannon and that's when efforts were made to positively identify him. They also located two projectiles inside that pillow. On cross, the defense says Pensacola is on the border of Florida and Alabama, and the witness is like, nope. It's about an hour and a half from the border. He says the bridge is about three quarters of a mile long, and it covers both dry area and water. They took DNA from the bridge workers since they touched the suitcase to eliminate them or just make sure that any DNA wasn't getting confused with who actually put gain in there. The defense asks how deep the bay is, and the witness says it depends on where you are. Right in the middle, it would be about 15 feet deep off of that bridge. The defense says, so there are longer bridges with bigger bodies of water nearby, and he says yes. He also talks about a pull-off area at the bridge. That's the only place you could pull off without getting hit if there's other cars on the bridge. On February 4th, 2020 at 4 a.m., which is when she is believed to have dumped the suitcase there, he said there's probably not a lot of traffic at all. The jurors had no questions and there was no redirect. We have Detective Berkowitz. 
he's a major crimes detective with El Paso County Sheriff's Office. And at the time Gannon was murdered, he had just joined the major crimes unit a few months before. He collected a lot of the evidence in this case. He explains how they log evidence in and they may put things in a storage locker or process it depending on what's happening at that given time there in the office. They have an open an envelope with evidence and it's the toothbrush and a holder and a comb. Other evidence that was shown to the jury, by the way, Al found this stuff in a dishwasher, scrub brushes with carpet material on them, a couple of pair of scissors, the handle of a brush, a scrub brush with possible hair and car carpet fiber, an empty vinegar bottle that was in the trash can and DNA swabs from both Al and Landon. On February 29th, Al had given investigators Gannon's Nintendo Switch and they show photos of the carrying case and the Nintendo Switch. He said he was a support detective on the case, so if they got a lead and the other investigators were busy, he would go follow up with that lead. On cross, he's asked if he watched the buckle swabs for DNA of Al and Landon being taken, and he said, actually, I was the one who did those. He doesn't remember if there was anybody else in the room when he did those swabs, and he doesn't know if anybody swapped Harley, who was Letitia's daughter. He interviewed Landon at the sheriff's office. It was audio and video recorded. He doesn't remember how long that interview with her took. And there were no questions from the jury and there was no redirect. I did not catch this witness's name, but he is with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. He was a patrol deputy when Gannon was called in as missing. He had a body cam on and he responded at 10.09 p.m., he explains that runaways are considered non-emergent, which I think is odd. If you have a minor who is not where they should be, it should automatically be an emergency. There were two officers on the scene when he got there. He made contact with a deputy Parker. He asked if the residents had been searched to see if maybe Gannon was hiding. He, he said a lot of times kids will hide because they get scared. They're going to get in trouble. The house had not been searched, so they get consent from Letitia to search the house to see if Gannon just happened to be inside. They played the video from this body cam. Letitia totally sounds unbothered, doesn't sound stressed. Uh, she is kind of peppy almost. And very quick with her answers, that was the one thing too, is clearly she had thought of what she was going to say from every piece of the questions that I'm sure she anticipated they might ask. Letitia said Gannon said he was going to a friend's house and doesn't know exactly what time he left because she was dealing with the candle mess downstairs. The audio kind of cut in and out at times. And I think part of the reason is we were watching the video from the officer who was doing the searching. And so there were times when he was out of the room with Letitia. They asked for her ID and she thinks it may be in the car. So the officer asked if this is the vehicle they had with them that day. And she said, no, I didn't drive this car today. He asked if Gannon has hidden in the car before. And she said, no. Then they're downstairs and she cut the carpet out because she says Gannon knocked the candle over. They said they went to check where he was supposed to be, but the people who live there obviously had not seen Gannon. Letitia tells the officers that she teaches fifth grade and she said, you have your mature fifth graders, but Gannon would not be one of those. She said he forgets stuff. She's asked if any of Gannon's clothing is missing and she said no. She said she lays his clothes out every day and he had on a blue jacket and blue jeans when he left. They asked if she's talked to his friends and she said she doesn't know any of their numbers. Letitia says Gannon was talking about a friend with an older sibling and she didn't know who that was. She said he took one of his gaming systems and someone from the neighborhood Facebook page messaged her with a picture of Gannon or who they thought was Gannon. And then someone else apparently told her they saw Gannon getting into a white SUV. The officer said no men were in the house when they searched or they would have seen them. They show some images, some still images that were taken from that body cam video the jury did have questions for the officer. Who was the first person to say Gannon was a runaway? The officer said it was Letitia when she made the call to report him missing. He's asked if there were any unusual smells in the room, and the officer says no, which I thought was a good question because if you remember, Letitia tried to make herself a hero saying that the smoke was choking her and she had to get a mask from the garage. A uh, smell like that would definitely still be in the house. He's asked if he saw any large suitcases, and he said re-watching the footage he did, but he didn't remember seeing it in person. 
The defense asked if there was any bleach smell, and he said no. So that ended day three. I'm going to pick up with days four, maybe get into five tomorrow. We're going to keep ticking on, and I'm still going to have that episode this week about shiny, happy people and break that down for those of you who don't want to watch or can't watch. Hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. We'll see you soon. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Tell your friends if they were interested in this case and couldn't listen or didn't want to listen that I'm doing a summary of the whole trial. Appreciate you guys getting the word out. Have a good one. We'll see you tomorrow. If you're Patreon, by the way, tonight, 815, we're doing our weekly live. So we'll see you then.